Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next Strategy Skills Podcast. Now, there are a lot of ways for a company to differentiate itself. There are a number of ways for a company to pick that one formidable asset, capability, skill around which it would build its point of differentiation. But sometimes the most common and obvious assets and capabilities are ignored because they just assume to be so common, even though they are not. Now, one of those things is judgment. Good, sound, rational, logical business judgment. If you could train all of your employees, think about this, if you could train all of your employees to have good judgment, can you imagine how formidable a competitive advantage you would have? Just think of the cost savings if you didn't have to put out binders and binders of rules and regulations because employees were applying common sense. Think of how formidable you'd be in customer service if your employees applied good judgment to know what customers wanted and gave it to them. They didn't have to follow a rule book. They didn't have to ask a superior. They didn't have to call in. They didn't have to go into the internet to see what the response is because they just had good judgment. Now, in management consulting, we hire people with good judgment because you want to watch them 24 hours. We can't watch them 24 hours. They're dealing with major problems with access to critical data. You need people where you don't have to tell them what is right because they have the judgment to know what is right. And if you look at the elite consulting firms, one of the reasons we've been elite is because we know that judgment is a formidable competitive advantage. Now, in today's episode, I have Martin Lindstrom, who is a New York Times bestselling author, but also a guru in marketing, as they say. Martin's a little bit different because he's done a lot of thinking around how he calls it common sense, which is, and he defines it later as partly empathy and judgment. He says you can't have good common sense without having empathy for clients, which is true. But what he's done is he's shown us how to think about common sense, judgment, and empathy as a competitive advantage rather than relying on traditional assets as a competitive advantage. I found his thinking quite interesting, especially when he gave examples of how hotels have these very complicated systems that they've broken down by just teaching employees to have common sense. Now, you know, firms consulting is a big believer in teaching you judgment. That's what we talk about, judgment, 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 judgment. But the part that maybe we don't talk about enough is how do you get judgment beyond just reading? and being exposed to things in the world. And the way you do that is by having empathy and caring for the people with whom you interact. I can talk about it a lot, but I'm going to let Martin do that in a few minutes. Just to get a bit of line from my side, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think that is actually what made the difference. So everything looks good. I can hear a good sound. So you are in Australia at the moment? No, I'm in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Saudi Arabia. Well, you do get around, don't you? <laughs> I guess I do. That explains oh, all yeah, where are you? I'm actually in Los Angeles at the moment. When you told me you're in Saudi Arabia, I kind of now understand why you have so many hotel analogies in your book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Okay, excellent. Thing, right? Look, thank you so much for making time. I read the book, I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank now, you. And I'm and, not and, just and, saying that because yeah. I think people just say it, you know, they really enjoyed the book. Yeah. But you actually got me to think about something differently, which I'll talk about in the interview. Oh, thank because you. I'm a management consultant. Yeah, and obviously you don't like management consultants. <laughs> I do, I do, but I do. I only like them if you could say that if they do not deliver a bunch of PowerPoint slides, but get that hands dirty and work with the immune system to make a change happen. And I think quite often the McKinsey's of the world are really, really good at developing or activating fear and developing a ton of PowerPoint. But it really does start, stop at that point, if you get what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. The job of a consultant is not to tell you how to fix the problem, it's to make sure the problem is fixed. Yeah. And, and I agree. A lot of consultants like to hide behind the fact that they're advisors only and it's not their fault nothing was fixed. Yeah. 
Yeah, right? it, exactly. it is the problem, and I, and I completely agree with you because the whole field of consulting called change management. Yeah, and I've worked in many many studies where I'll speak to the partner in change management, and I'll ask her how's it going, and she'll say, "Well, we did fifteen different things to change the mind of the organization." And then I'll ask at the end, so did they change? And she said, no. So how can you call it a successful change management exercise if nobody changed, right? Yeah, I so agree with you. And quite often, I'm called in after the McKinsey's, the Boston Consulting Groups of the World have been there, which yes. is exactly what I'm sure what you're experiencing as well in your job, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I do feel that, you know, like any elite field, there are a lot of consulting firms that hide behind PowerPoints and don't do what they're supposed to. Even, I think, within elite firms, there are some offices and partners who don't do the kind of work they, they should be doing. Absolutely. Uh, we are on the same page. You're talking to the converted here. <laughs> good, good. So I'm not going to do an introduction now. I'll do an introduction to this recording later after we've talked so, about everything, and we'll splice no it in. Now we're just going to have a conversation about everything I read about. It's not just the book. I think the book is one part of it. I think it's, it's a message you're delivering that's quite interesting to me. And I'm going to give you an analogy of how I have reflected on what you've said in the book. How does that sound as a starting point? Fantastic. I would love it. I mean, you are literally the first person I'm talking with about this book. So I am super curious to hear what you have to say and your reflections on it. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I'm not going to name the company because it's not a good story. But let's just say it's a very famous printer company, right? Yeah. And every time I go online to the Apple Store, to Amazon, to any major tech review site like Wirecutter in the New York Times, they always recommend printers from this company. So over the course of one year, I bought five printers from this company. I had them delivered to my office, and I thought this should be pretty easy to set up. So I plug in the printer, I turn it on, and I'm trying to figure out how to connect my Wi-Fi to the printer so I can do wireless printing. And every time I try this, something happens that goes wrong. Either the manual talks about a feature that no longer exists in the printer, if I call customer service, if they can't figure out the problem or they move me around from department to department. So I bought one printer. I got frustrated. I sent it back. Then I bought another printer from them. Same problem. I sent it back. I've bought five printers from them the entire time. Now, what's interesting about this? Right? You talk about common sense, and I think that's one part of it, which is a very, very good part of it. I got thinking about is when we buy a product or we experience a service that in our definition is dysfunctional, very rarely do we see it as symptomatic of dysfunction in an organization. It's almost as if when you buy a product that's not working well, you experience a service that's not great. It's like you're reading tea leaves of how a company is organized. So I found that interesting because as consultants, we tend to look at the financials and the organization itself as touchstones of what's happening. But you've got me thinking about how you can review a product to analyze how a company is performing. And I thought that was a very interesting way of the way you presented your anecdotes about products to reflect on the company. Now, so that's my take on it. Am I touching the right points you want to raise? Absolutely. I mean, the, the essence of this is two things. We have become collectively blind for what common sense is. Yeah. And the problem is common sense is like a muscle. Yeah. The more you use your muscles, the more you you are in tune with it, you're on the same frequency with it. Yeah. The less you use it, the more collectively blind you become. And that quite often is amplified through companies where quite often the internal organization become more busy dealing with themselves yes. and dealing with their own bureaucracy and red tape. And because of that, they go through one compromise after another, and that spills through, as you rightly say, spills through the entire system, throughout the channels to the consumer, which ends up with this mediocre product where we end up being frustrated. And the worst thing is we start to, start to blame ourselves. We feel we are idiots. I feel um, I'm probably not technical enough. Mm -hmm. I, I'm probably falling behind the trends right now. So we don't even dare to say to people, yes. the reality is, it's not our fault. It's the company and it's a lack of common sense. Yeah. So in a manner of speaking, a bad product is a lag indicator of an organization that's dysfunctional. It has to be dysfunctional it first and it flows through into the product. Absolutely. You're spot on. You know, you should have written my book. <laughs> next one. We can co-write the next one. Very well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it, it's interesting because when you see CEOs talk about a failed product, 
they make it sound like the failure is just isolated to this product and if they just change the teams it's going to change but it, it flows from the dna of the organization unless they change the organization the product's never going to be fixed right absolutely and, and the dna of an organization you have to remember is suffering from one other thing which i find super fascinating and, and this is this is very problematic for me to tell to you and, and, and the listeners right now because the key essence to all this stuff, the reason why common sense is disappearing is because empathy is disappearing in our lives. Yes. Now, empathy is my ability to put myself in the shoes of another person yes. and feel what the person is feeling. So if the people from that printer company, the employees from this printer company, would have experienced what you experienced, yeah. they would have felt that pain, that yeah. anger, that frustration, and I'm pretty sure you were almost about to kill anyone. That was <laughs> really the state you had, right? Well, actually, were... actually, no. My view is when I call customer service, unless I'm super nice to them, they're never going to help. No. Because I know how frustrating it is to talk to customers. So when I call customer service, I always make them feel good so they will take the time to help me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are you, you are a smart person. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I could scan your brain, there's a degree of frustration hidden in there somewhere. Somewhere, anyway, yes, but, but, I, but I keep it to myself. <laughs> yeah, good good trick. But, but, but the issue here is, why do I talk about empathy? I talk about empathy because not only have organizations lost the connection with consumers. They think they can screen and understand the consumer through uh, some you know, random survey. data. Yes. Right? A survey, right? But the second element, which is equally frustrating or worrisome, is the fact that companies increasingly are separated into silos. And yeah. those silos um, are happening because I have no empathy whatsoever from another division. Why would I care about them? They are navigating through another set of KPIs than I am. We have nothing in common. And not only that, you as an individual are quite often more concerned about your own performance than your team's performance. So we have two sets of silos. So if I need to fix an issue in an organization, like, for example, the printer case you gave me, well, guess what? That typically will touch spaces on three or four aspects. It may be the cartridge uh, the department, which is one revenue stream. It may be it's the actual manufacturing unit. It may be it's the local uh, you know, company which yeah. is distributing that particular printer. You can find all sorts of different divisions and functions which are responsible for this, and they all have to work together in order to create a seamless experience for you. Well, guess what? They don't talk together because they don't care about each other internally. So you clearly feel it at the end of the day. They're not even thinking about it because they're more busy about themselves and, and dealing with all their you know, day-to-day KPIs, right? Yes, but it, it seems fairly obvious that a dysfunctional team will have a dysfunctional product. So, so why are people allowing it to happen? Well, I think the best way to illustrate that is, is um, I think Al Gore once many years ago uh, adopted this metaphor of there's two ways to kill a frog. You can either put it into a boiling pot with water in it and it will jump out straight away or you can put it into this cold water and it will slowly boil mm. and guess what, it will die because it will not notice that slight yes. difference taking place all the time. The reality here is that when you are a startup company, then you are in one mindset and mm. quite often that mindset is due to the founder who experienced yes. a problem and it was so profound that that person decided to set up a company for it. Example one would be the founder of, of Snap. Yeah. You know, the two guys setting it up, one of these guys, he actually was smoking hash. And as he was smoking hash, his friend took a photo of him. And, and that photo he sent out. And, you know, that was pretty embarrassing. So he said to himself the day after, I wish I could have deleted that. And that became Snap, Snap originally, right, as it was, because then you can delete the photo straight away. And if you take the, the founder of, of, of Uber, exactly the same. He was in Paris. He hailed a taxi. And these quite often arrogant taxi drivers in yeah. Paris, I live there, and um, they didn't want to. They didn't want to go with him to the airport because that was out of their time zone or whatever yeah. it was. And um, so he got so fostered. And he said, "Why don't we create a service around it?" So point number one is, an entrepreneur is developing a solution based on a problem they've experienced. Why did they experience it? Because they had a really strong emotional connection to that problem they had. Now, as the company grows bigger. That connection to that epicenter of emotions which the founder had 
to all the other divisions and functions, it, it just becomes more and more distant. And as it becomes a conglomerate, as it becomes listed or, or goes on the stock exchange, suddenly we end up with a complete disconnect between the founder's original ideas and the, the feeling he or she had and what employee number 252,000 feels. And there's really no empathy to that core, and which really was the reason why the whole organization was established in the first way. But so let's just get back to the basics here, right? Common sense. I read about common sense. I saw it as good judgment, which I think you define later as common sense is a function of judgment and empathy. Yeah. So let's get back to this brass tacks here, right? You need to have good judgment. Why are people or organizations struggling to develop the skill? I've never heard an organization ever make judgment a priority in the way it trains its employees. I've never seen that. Well, I'll give you an example. I was uh, in a... I'm in a hotel right now in Saudi Arabia, of all places, right? It's an international hotel. It's called Park Hired. As you know, it's coming out of Chicago, I think, yeah. originally. And they have a, a branch office here in, uh, in Jeddah, where I'm in. Now, as you may be aware, people in the Middle East go to the toilet in different ways yeah. than what we used to in the United States. So I just went to the toilet and I, was, I wanted to grab for my toilet paper and there was no toilet paper at all. No toilet paper and no toilet paper holder. <laughs> Gone. Gone. Yeah. Because they don't use it in the Middle East. Now, do you think there is any international visitors coming to an international hotel in Saudi Arabia <laughs> no, the answer is yes. Yes, but because the local management and the local developers see the world through their lens, yes. right? They don't see what or feel what another person is feeling. So my message here is very simple: you have to reactivate that feeling of what a customer feels. Mm. And I'll give you another example. So one of our clients is a large pharmaceutical. Company, they are one of the, the largest player in uh, respiratory disease problems in asthma. And I asked these guys at this conglomerate, how well do you understand empathy? And the first thing they said is, why do we need to talk about it? I said, mm -hmm. listen, if you have asthma or respiratory disease, you go through a degree of fear which you would have no idea about unless you tried it. They said, fine, fair enough. So we said to them, what is your degree of empathy? They said, we understand our patients perfectly. We yeah. really Everyone it. says Promise. that. Everyone yeah. says that. <laughs> Fantastic. Eight out of ten, they said to us. Then I said, okay, let's first of all give you a straw. Then I would like you to breathe through this straw, but you have to hold the straw with your fingers so that it closes the opening 50%. Then I'm going to switch off the light, and I'm going to play a sound bite which is the, the sound of a person with very severe breathing difficulties, mm. which is not particularly nice to listen to because it sounds like <gasps> that type of sound. Yeah, yeah. After 30 seconds, people in the room started to scream. Wow. I then switched on the light and I said to them, what were your true degree of empathy before versus now? And they said, we were completely off track. I said, what are the consequences in your company based on what you learned now? My God, they said, we have to design the product differently. We have to give people different instructions. We need to talk about this disease in a different way, using more human terms. We need to give them support tools to get through this in a different way. In, what happened in a split second was that everyone realized they saw the world through the complete different um, wrong lens in this case. This is the essence of it. We have become so busy dealing with emails, dealing with text messages, dealing with... Uh, WhatsApp messages mm -hmm. and politics and meetings and PowerPoint presentations and meeting rooms which doesn't work with technology in them and all that good stuff that we are more busy running around inside than actually getting out of that office and talking to the consumer and experiencing what they're experiencing. And what I'm saying to you right now is an ABC in what we, we are taught as children. But the reality is the world has slowly drifted us away from that thinking and blinded us. And that's what I'm talking about with this water getting warmer and warmer. It's gotten so warm that we don't even realize we're slowly dying. And that's the reason why businesses are going out of business. Well, you would have said with the tax industry, why didn't they realize this? Mm. It's pretty obvious. Well, I guess what? I was in Denmark the other day. And in Denmark, they had Uber and it was banned by the government last year. So I sat in a taxi and I said to the taxi driver, wow, you guys were lucky. So tell me, 
what did you learn? And listen, I would have thought he would say to me, clean the taxis, get the service, we had yeah. to arrive earlier, we had to be nicer, we had to go up and open the door, and maybe you even have a bottle of water. I mean, that was in a serious problem when Uber came in, right? Do you know what he said to me? Nothing. He literally said nothing. And I thought with myself, where is that disconnect happening? And yeah. it happens because we become collectively blind. Well, I want to unpack what you said, because you said two important things, very important things. First one is that it sounds as if it's very hard to have the right judgment unless you have empathy first, so you can yep. apply the right lens. So so it seems as if good judgment, the driver of good judgment is empathy. Yeah. That's an interesting thing of way of looking at it, because we always tell our clients to, to focus on having good judgment. And we tell them judgment is a function of who your friends are, you know, because that's your, your network. But but again, you can boil it all down to having empathy. So that's one important point you're making that I agree with. The second one, which is very, very interesting, is the way you're explaining this, and I like it, is most companies, they decide internally what their customers want through surveys and think tanks and experts, and they push that on customers. But what you're proposing is let's really understand what customers are going through and then design what they need. Is that a good way of thinking about it? It, it certainly is. And I'll give you a very controversial example. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you know, today I'm in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia opened up the opportunity for women to drive mm-hmm. about a year ago. And we've been partly asked to help make that become a reality in Saudi Arabia. So I've worked a lot with transformation of countries, of companies, or, or whatever may be big things, typically. What we realized was that if you have, as a woman, been stuck inside your home for your entire life, because remember, they could only leave their homes yes. unless they had a driver or yeah. a husband or brother would drive them. Um, also, they were not allowed to leave the home. They would, there would be basically curtains uh, covering the lights. So it would be very dark in the room, and they would wear uh, a cover over them as they leave the home. Yes. Now, in theory... Everyone would say, fantastic, uh, these people would be thrilled to be able to drive. But let me just give you an analogy. There was an experiment done with chickens some years ago. They put into a cage, stopped into a cage, and after half a year, the gates were open to the beautiful green grass, and the sun was shining, and the birds were singing, and the chickens went out, and guess what happened? They walked straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And that's exactly what I've experienced here in Saudi Arabia, that even though women would love to have a driver license, they're so afraid of it because they've never been outside that cage that, in fact, they're not taking it off. And that's the reason why the number of driver licenses issued in Saudi Arabia is surprisingly low. Mm. Now, no one would have experienced that unless you would have been out driving with women and into them in their homes, which is exactly what I'm doing right now. And once I realized and feel the sense of fear a woman is feeling when she's taken out of her home for the first time in her life, 32 years old. I mean, it sounds crazy what I'm telling you right now, but this is true. Then you know what buttons to press in order to make her feel comfortable about making that journey yes. from this uh, cage to a uh, chicken cage to, uh, to another reality. Now, there's no way you can read a textbook about that. Yeah. You have to experience it. And that's where companies quite often go wrong. It's not enough to just put out a new rule, a regulation, a procedure. You've got to almost help people along. You have to, you have to handhold people in the journey. And, you have, and the only way you are able to predict people's pushback mm. is by feeling what they're feeling. And this is the tricky part of it because... As soon as I say empathy in a corporation, they think about fluffy cupcakes, right? Yes. Uh, because it, it really is not something you normally would talk about. But what's, first of all, I do think this is going to be the next big thing after talking about company culture. Mm-hmm. Because I think people will realize that um, we have lost empathy. Empathy is disappearing in our world. Think about it. Um, uh, the study conducted recently which shows that students more than 10,000 students in the university uh, were a decade half the degree of empathy in the United States. Um, so why is that? Well, the reason why is because when you're on your smartphone as much as we are, mm-hmm. we don't connect with our surroundings yeah. the same way. When I use Tinder, I'm connecting with the person for five seconds and immediately making a judgment. When I'm using Twitter, 
I only have a little bit more than 100 characters to express my emotions. And when I use Botox, listen to this, this is crazy. The studies are showing now that when I use Botox, my small micro movements in my skin, on my head, my face, are disappearing. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're connecting less with your surroundings. And in fact, studies are now showing that your connection with your baby, if you're mom, is basically cut off. So what happens as a consequence of all this stuff is that we accumulately uh, are, are losing this sense of empathy. And that, of course, is further amplified in offices where technology plays a huge role of all this stuff. So what I'm saying is companies have to be aware of, you probably have reached a low point mm. in history of empathy, and we need to reactivate that. Yes. So what I'm hearing in 20 years, we're going to get a lot of therapists. We're going to get a lot of business because of babies that have been traumatized by Botox wearing parents. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. What you will hear five <laughs> or 10 years from now is probably what you hear in Scandinavia, where people, when they go to class, so toddlers and tweens and teens, when they go in school, there is something called empathy class. Empathy which is the case class. now. And that's where you learn about empathy. And that will probably very soon become a reality because the whole Me Too movement is a reflection of lack of empathy in the yes. past. Right? That's a good way um, so, and it's basically just a symptom of it. And that's the case with almost everything else we're seeing right now. Good. I want to shift gears a little bit, right? I mean, I can't still forget that there were some researchers who decided to put some chickens in a cage for one year. I don't know what possessed <laughs> them to do that. <laughs> I feel sorry for those chickens, right? <laughs> All in the name of science. But let's just shift gears because you use a lot of hotel analogies and you're in a hotel now. But one of the things that struck me, if you have empathy and understand the needs of your customers by putting yourself in their shoes, it becomes a very big operational challenge to demonstrate you care about your customers. Because you gave an example of how, you know, I think it was your example of your trip whereby you were sniffling, you arrive at the front desk, and by the time you got to your room, there was some tea and some notes on where to find pills for a cold or something. But I'm thinking companies need to really change the way they operate themselves to be empathetic. They do, because the experience I have with this stuff is that it requires, first of all, multiple functions to work together yes. seamlessly, right? And as I said previously, that's really tricky. So that's point number one. Point number two is you need to give people a mandate to act within a space which is not necessarily defined. Yes. Um, and, and that space it means that you need to give people trust back. Um, there is today very limited trust. Why? Because people fundamentally believe that we can't trust any employees. So therefore, we need to create rules and regulations around them. We have mm -hmm. compliance and processes. And suddenly what happens is I only have a certain amount of mandate to act uh, if there is a problem. Yes. And some of the best examples I've seen and some of the best examples you probably have experienced when you have experienced outstanding customer service is when people actually went outside their authority. Yes. Um, that's where, as I'm writing in, in, in the book, that's where I tried once I was checking in in the airport. Yeah, and, I remember and, that example. And, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was this crazy story where the guy literally, I'm checking in and, and, and I have to go with an airline and it's not that terminal. And I guess that, that terminal is just so far away, it would take 45 minutes or an hour to get to that terminal. And the guy literally say, run with me. And we're running behind security the entire way, in and out. Now, he had no authority to do that. Yeah. He, had, he was breaking all sorts of rules. Um, but at the end of the day, he ends up in my book and hopefully that gives him a pat on the shoulder and saying, well done. But it's a story about where we trust people again. We do not trust people today. There is all sorts of systems, and I think Amazon is a very good system, uh, proving that, that this is not the right direction. In Amazon's warehouse, they're measuring people to an extreme degree uh, about performance. And increasingly, we're seeing that people are reporting to a AI technology. Mm. Uh, you know, as I'm writing in the book, yes. there's one example about... Um, the lights. People in call centers, for, 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 for call centers and insurance companies, which are, which are monitored and they're reporting to yes. an AI system. So they have, when they sound tired, there's a little cup of coffee appearing. And if they sound too cheery, there's a lot of sad space appearing on the screen. Now, when you control that much, two things are happening. You're more focused on not breaking rules, right? Because yes. you want to achieve that goal which has been set on you. 
But the second thing is, once you are witnessing a case where you had to think outside your core space in order to make the customer happy, the customer uh, would expect you to do it because it's common sense, but that person in the meantime has lost the common sense. And that's where you have this breakdown. So you need to give a mandate and authority back and really trust the employees. And what is amazing is there was a study done on this. A study done where people were, uh, there was a bonnet with money placed in it and it was basically just left around the world on various streets, okay, yeah. with a business card in it. And what this showed was that people actually, in a majority of cases, would deliver back not just the wallet, but also the money, and they yeah. would not have taken a thing. And it was even in countries where you would not expect that to happen. Now, of course, countries like Switzerland, Scandinavia, these type of, of, of uh, you know, unique countries in terms of that mindset, of course, were highest. But I can tell you, countries like Pakistan, India, and Iran, and, and, and here in the Middle East, they were ranking very close up there. And, and this, for me, is a really good indication of that we fundamentally don't trust people uh, because of systems, but actually we build the trust back into the system. That's where you make people work together because then we trust each other and have almost like a collective responsibility, right? But inherently, there is a reason why there's distrust in the system. Well, there is a reason because the lowest common denominator is defining everyone else. Yes. It's because the 1% steals, so the 99% have to suffer from it. Mm. But the money and the energy and the restrictions caused on protecting or uh, encapsulating that 1% is going to, by, by far, Cause uh, damage, not, yeah. not, not stick up to the money you would have Saved and the value would gone out of it not to create those rules and actually say, okay, fine, we will lose money with those 1%, but the 99% would be so much better if they don't have restrictions. Yeah, another way of saying it is the companies and societies, they're building a society that punish, that protects them from the 1%, but in the process, they punish the, the 99%. Absolutely. And that's the problem. But I'll go back to the example of the airline, where this guy was jogging around and taking you between airport security and so on. This is an interesting example. Now, in that example, this is only a good story if he was not punished at the end for breaking the rules, right? Yeah, it was. And and quite often that's happening, that people are, are punished. Because if this case would have happened in the US, he probably would have been punished. Yes. Because someone would have said, well, he's breaking the TSA rules here. Yeah. Um, but that comes back to TSA. So let's just talk about TSA for a second. I went through TSA the other day, and there was a sign saying, if you are old, and you're 75 years or older, uh, you don't need to go for a screening. And I went up to this TSA guy, a lot of the guy is not that, and I said to him, so tell me, if you are a terrorist, is it official that you basically retire at the age of 75? <laughs> <laughs> you actually use the word terrorist in an airport, which is even more brave of you. <laughs> well, what is the logic? <laughs> Explain for me the logic here, right? I don't understand it. it maybe it's me with the silly. I mean, and, and the guy said to me, by the way, it was not him, but another guy asked about a sim somewhat similar question in, in uh, immigration in JFK. He said to me, listen, guess what? It's, we actually have experienced it. People who are 75 years old are actually quite often are more dangerous than those below because they are, you know, they are just not sticking up the same way, right? Yeah. And so he said it's kind of running that rule, but that is that is symptomatic for where we are. We create some rules and we create an independent peer pressure around all of us. So even you are saying you dare to say terrorist. Of course, I dare to say terrorist. It doesn't mean I'm a terrorist for yeah. saying that. For God's sake, let's wake up here, right? But we almost become so much chicken case. We're all sitting in that chicken case and we're shaking. And if one person is just saying a little bit outside it, we immediately will be picked down because you can't say that. Well, honestly, why can't I say that? And, and that, is, that is where I think that uh, the fear, the ramifications, the precaution, all that stuff is killing common sense. We don't even allow ourselves to think from the other point of view, which is, let's just find another way of solving that problem and just creating rules which are so stiff 
that basically the entire world is suffering for the fact that one guy, remember, one guy on British Airways, he had a shoe yes. with some, and whatever it was, and that caused us to have the special rule now with 311. And basically, millions, if not billions of passengers have to suffer from one guy. By the way, there was no accidents yes. happening. But we're all suffering from that instance, right? Yeah. Well, let's just think about this, right? So what you're proposing makes sense. I agree with everything you're saying. The companies need to put their, an employee, a company needs to see things from the perspective of their consumers. So they have empathy and they make decisions that are good for their consumers or customers. And if you make decisions that are good for consumers and customers, you help them, they buy from you and everyone benefits, right? Yeah. But what happens in a situation whereby, and I'm just thinking out aloud here, what happens in a situation where you are like the TSA, where you are dealing with millions and billions of people, where you can't segment your customers, you have customers with different needs. So there's going to be situations where you're going to be upsetting large constituencies no matter what you do, right? Yeah. Because you can't choose yeah. who you're going to serve. You've got to serve everyone. Well, the best thing you can do is through your system to allow a lifeline which are leading up to common sense. Okay, I like that. Let's explore that. Well, the idea is very simple. I understand and I respect all those good people which are on the front line dealing with a very painful job. And the fact that they can wake up in the morning and do it and still somewhat smile, yes. it's very impressive. So they follow rules and they have to follow rules in order to execute the job because there's so many thousands of people doing that job. But in the system, they also need to be a a bell you can ring. Mm. And that is when a person is going through this and he has a tic-tac in his pocket and he's being arrested for it. This is a true story. Um, <laughs> then, then, then uh, there has to be someone in each of those departments which is installed with common sense yes. and which is free of all these rules but which is using common logic and where there's no ramification of making that decision if it makes pure mm. sense. Yes. Okay? Because you cannot, no matter how creative you are, explain for me or tell me that a, a, a box of tic tacs is dangerous. I don't think anyone would be able to put up an argument around that. Yeah. So why is it causing the person to can't board the plane? And, and so this is my story that you need to have a lifeline to a common sense person. And that person needs to keep a very clear mind about how would a passenger feel and what makes sense and what are really the ramifications of this. Is it really going to cause an issue uh, in terms of plane, plane safety or whatever? And you can have multiple levels. It's not that like you need to have a person who is an expert in whole, the whole aviation industry per se. You can have a person with the same, do you know what? I think there's something what you, about what you're saying. Let me just call my common sense line. Yes. And you call a common sense line, which is somewhere in a headquarter, somewhere in, in hidden on the ground. And the person is saying, hey, I have a case with a tic tac here. And the person in the other line is saying, do you know what? Just let it go. You won't have a ramification. Here's a code for you. Code 5529, it clears you. If there's any problems down there with the officers, you use this code and it means that you're safe. You won't be fired. Super simple. And it will work. So... What you're saying, and I agree here, is that we oftentimes, not it's not that we don't have empathy, we're not in a position to act on that empathy because rules forbid us from doing it. Absolutely. Uh, I think I think we build up a black and white net around us, safety net around us, which is either yes or no, but there's no gray zones anymore. And the, gray, yeah. and the reason why, by the way, is because technology do not allow for gray zones. If you place that dot in your email the wrong way, it won't work. Okay. Yes, yes. I mean, an example of this is I was reading recently in a local school, some children, teenagers, I mean, 13, 14 years are going to be prosecuted for something they did, which is just childhood prank. Yeah. And I'm thinking you're going to give them a criminal record that's going to be with them for a long time just because they did something that you should laugh about. It, that's an example of good judgment. You know, do you really want to throw the book at them over something that is so minor? Yeah, because if you take a look at statistics later on, if they go into the system yes. of punishment, there is all sorts of statistics proving that they most likely will become a criminal then, even though in the beginning there was really no path for them pointing in that direction. So that's where you need to have good judgment, which comes back to common sense. But if the society is built around very strict rules, which is yes and no, and no gray zones, we lock itself into that and that comes back to so let me just explain the chicken case in a part two version mm -hmm. because if i was to place four chicken cages 
on this grass. They will yeah. all point towards each other. Uh, I'll open the gates and I'll ask these chickens to go out. Now, first of all, uh, none of them will go out. So I have some corn yeah. and I can place this corn somewhere. Now, typically, people will place the corn in the center. So yeah. all chickens can sit in the center. They have to walk a couple of feet to yeah. get there. Now, what will happen? First chicken will look out. And it will look first at the corn. It's a fantastic, beautiful corn. And then the second thing the chicken will do is to look at the other chickens and see what the other chickens are doing. And the other chicken will look at you and say, hmm, uh, I don't dare to do it. They don't dare to do it. And they'll go back. Yes. So what do you do to change a behavior in the organization? You place the corn straight outside the chicken cage. So the chicken can eat it straight away. And guess what happens at that second? All the other chickens are looking at this chicken eating the corn and saying, wow, that looks, that looks really delightful. And then they do the same. At that stage, you have, as a united group, accepted mm -hmm. a behavior change. And then what you do is you celebrate it. You celebrate within the organization. You're saying, whoa, we actually succeeded making a slight change. Yes. And then you place the next corn, next corn leading to the corn in the very center. So it's so incremental. You, it's incremental. It's super incremental. But there is a dimension to this. I call that 90-day interventions when we do transformation in organizations because you have to break it down to 90 days. Not a whole, not a year strategy. Forget about it. Yes. 90 days was a celebration. And this is a really important point. You have to celebrate the victory internally. Because if you celebrate that victory, it gives a permission to everyone to change. Yes. It creates almost an emotional safety net underneath everyone so they won't be punished for that behavioral change. And that is the biggest fear everyone has, particularly in a society where rules and regulations are driving our behavior. That's interesting. You talk about celebrating those little victories because the way you said it, normally people think you celebrate the victory to reward the person who changed but what you're saying is you celebrate the victory to give others permission to see they can also change is that what i heard is that i hear that correctly absolutely and the second even more important because two things are happening first of all the others whoever that is will say oh i want to have that feeling of success the first one had and the second thing is once the others are following the first person it gives the first person kind of a sense of pride and that probably means that suddenly you have a leader of change in the organization. And that really becomes a change agent. This sounds like a really great argument when a hedge fund billionaire has a $10 million party and he says, I'm doing it to inspire everyone else, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> but it's good, exactly. right? So so let's just go back here, right? In the book, you, you have this good example of a blue script and a red script. No, blue script and green script. Blue script and green script. Now, I've never heard of this idea of having two, for lack of a better word, plans on the same thing for different audiences so the different constituents know what's important to them. Because typically, organizations have the same plan. They kind of push everything in there, ignoring who's going to be reading it, right? That's true. So really, I'll give you a backstory. Mm -hmm. When Homer Simpson became very popular back in the days yeah. of The Simpsons became popular, it was not because just a story. If you really analyze the, uh, the series, you will notice they have three scripts. They actually have an adult script, they have a children's script, and they also have an international script. So if you sat in the room with very young kids, you sat in a room with adult Americans, and you sat in a room with an international audience, those three groups will laugh at three completely different points. But it'll be, they're watching the same show, right? They're watching the same show, but the show is really catering for three different audiences, but it's waved into the same narrative. And that idea really originally was invented by Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock. So Alfred Hitchcock, the greatest movie director uh, of probably of all time, he always worked with two manuscripts. He had the blue script yeah. and he had the green script. The blue script was a rational script. It was uh, the props. The yeah, lights, functional, very yeah. functional. Yeah, All that stuff, yes. But the green script was really a description of how you should feel throughout the, uh, the, the whole movie. And yes. he literally would map down minute by minute exactly how you would feel. He would feel scared. He would feel empathy, he would feel fear, he would feel love, whatever it is. Minute by minute, he would flesh it out. And what was so amazing about it is that he would measure it against it later on when he was watching the movies mm. along with the audience. Now, I'm talking about a similar script in organizations. Yes. The rational scripts of the 
the blue script is really the functional script. That's all the rules and regulations departments, all this stuff. Yes. But the, the but the green script is really how you remove uh, the lack of common sense and make people work together. And you can do that along the other way. And what's really important to say is that I know it sounds fluffy when I say common sense. And I know it sounds fluffy when I talk about empathy. But do you know what's so amazing about this stuff? You actually can introduce this while saving money or even earning money at the same time. Mm. And I don't think people are aware of that. Um, that you actually can create these proof points. I, I'll give you a quick example. So some years ago, uh, the Toyota factories in Japan, uh, they uh, they were spending millions and millions of dollars or yen uh, on power bills. And they wanted to save the environment because Japan is very much into saving the environment. Yeah. So they asked people to install a sense of common sense. Um, and one guy came up with a brilliant idea and basically said, Listen, if you go to these plants where there is all these robots collecting cars, if you look around, there's not a single human being in those plants. So why is all the light switched on? Yes. And it's such a simple idea. And by installing common sense, they actually save millions and millions of dollars. That stuff, as this example is, is pointing towards, actually is happening every minute in every organization all the time. We just don't see it. We don't question it because... Uh, the overall guidelines are telling us not to do so. But there's a lot happening here, right? Let's just think about this. I don't think empathy is fluffy at all. I think it's that business literature and business experts have deemed it to be fluffy. And that's why it's almost treated as if it's a second cousin of strategy and operations. But if I go into a bank, I'm going to have to see my private banker later today. I'm hoping that this lady has a script which says this is the part of the conversation she's going to delight me in and I'm going to come away feeling like I'm worth a million dollars. But to me, it would seem obvious that a company is doing X, whether it's launching an insurance product, offering a credit card service or something to make customers happy. But what it sounds as if companies are not measuring that. They don't know at which point their customer is going to be happy. As long as they get a transaction and there's no refund, they seem to be quite happy with it. Well, and, and that's a very valid point. I'll give you an example from, from, from a client of ours, which is Maersk. Maersk is the largest shipping company in the world. They sit on 21% of all trade. So they're big players. They transport billions and billions of products uh, every day. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we were called in to help reinstall uh, common sense in the organization, among others. And I was sitting in a call center in China listening to all these thousands of calls, many of them complaints. And as I sat there with my interpreter, I realized that a lot, if not all of these calls, all of these complaints happen to be categorized as force majeure. Yeah. And, and force majeure, just for the the listeners here is really when something serious is happening. I mean, an earthquake or something. Act of it's not God, like, right? Yeah, there's something act of God. I think they call yes, it. Yes, act of God. That was kind of weird because I mean, first of all, there was no earthquake around, and how can basically thousands of these things be related to it? So I started to investigate it, and I realized that if you, in the course, are clicking uh, force majeure on your screen, you only have to fill up one screen. If you click anything else, you have to fill up three screens. And so why did they do that? Well, it's very simple. The KPIs for that particular customer service department was not on service, it was on time, mm -hmm. i.e. the more screens they filled up, the quicker, the faster, and then more bonus. So they were measured on the wrong thing. And that is really symptomatic for most of the organizations that they measure things uh, yes. the wrong way. And not only that, that the many different divisions of functions are not measured the same way. And that means that they have different interests which are not necessarily working in conjunction with each other, they are in conflict with each other. Yeah. Uh, which means that that free-floating synergy we talked about previously is really breaking down, which makes it even harder then to create a customer experience, particularly yes. given the fact that in shipping, you're so dependent on so many different functions working together in order to transport a container from destination A to B, right? Yeah, what was interesting about this is, and it's a very good point, I was a consultant, I am a consultant, management consultant. A big part of the way we operate is that when we see a story or someone talking about how they experienced what a customer went through, we classify it as anecdotal evidence. 
Yeah. And what we want is we really downplay anecdotal evidence because we say it's one person's view of things. And what we'll then do is we'll say, let's get a set of data points of 20 people's views of things. And we would rather look at the trend in that data point. But now the point I'm trying to make here is that the data trend we see is only valuable if the underlying data is collected correctly. And as you show in the Maersk example, a lot of times, due to a number of reasons, the data is sometimes flawed, right? Yeah. And this is the balance between what I define as big data and small data. Yeah. So, so big data is all about correlation and small yeah. data is all about causation, the reason yes. why the hypothesis. Yeah. And the majority of companies out there, I mean, 99.9% want to have a big data strategy, whatever yes. that is. Yeah. You and don't know what it is. To, it just sounds good. <laughs> this sounds good. And literally, I've been in so many board meetings where they say we want to have a big data strategy, right? Because everyone else has it. But uh, the, the, here's the crazy thing. With big data, you very quickly can conclude that the more umbrellas people buy, the more it rains. Yes. So it has nothing to do with reality. And, and I think with the small data, which I define as seemingly insignificant observations you make in people's lives, which yes. is what you decide as anecdotal evidence, yeah. is really where you pick up these small evidence, uh, like the straw I mentioned with this pharma company, which is, metaphorically speaking, trying to uh, bottle, uh, so to speak, an emotional and feeling and then sprinkle it across a lot of people. Yes. Now, the fact that I met one person, which I did, this is a true story, I actually met one patient, or rather a person in my team met one patient uh, in Italy, which, which said, well, when he was a kid, he actually in school would give, he would give all his friends a straw and breathe for the straw so they could feel how he felt. And that actually created that empathy between yes. his friends and they became very close friends. Now, that's one person telling me that. Okay, and based on that, we then are building a whole hypothesis around it. And then you can use big data later on to verify this is true or not. But the hypothesis is pretty strong. Um, and that's what's lacking because we're so busy uh, mining numbers because we prefer to sit in our office. As soon as you get your hands dirty and move into reality, it's dirty, it's smelly, it's, it, you, you can't find patterns straight away, it's complex, mm. it's difficult to map down, all that stuff. So we sort of rather skip it. Right. Yes. And what you, you said something very important. I want to distill it for the audience. Everyone wants a big data strategy because everyone wants to be like Amazon and everyone wants to be like Microsoft and Netflix and so on. And when you go with this big data strategy of crunching vast data sets, the most important thing you need to have up front is an hypothesis. Otherwise, you just run around in circles chasing data. Excellent. And an hypothesis comes from what I think is small data observations, which you then test in the big data. Yeah. So when a company says we want a big data strategy, it's going to solve all our problems, that's what we're going to focus on. No, it's big data is going to help you test what you're seeing in the small data, but you can't ignore one. They are complementary. Absolutely. And here's what's even better. Everyone else is searching towards the big data dire and yes. direction. And they're all ending up with the same conclusions because they all have access to the same type of tools to mining those data. Yeah. But when you do the small data observations, you actually find data points which quite often are outliers. Yes. They are because no one else has spotted them. And they actually each represent a profound insight into a product or a new service which no one else has thought about before. And that's where you create amazing innovation around it. Um, I, I'll give you an example about this. So I'm writing about in, in my book, um, the, the Ministry of Commerce Center, I'm writing about an example from Swiss International Airlines. So they came to us and they said, hey, um, we are not necessarily uh, always on time. And we would like to be perceived as being the on-time airline while we also simultaneously are fixing the, the engine of being on time. Now, as you know, Swiss and Switzerland is perceived yeah. as being on time, so it, it fits very well to the narrative. So anyway, we, we, were, we were sitting on the plane and, and, uh, and one of the colleagues there suddenly observed as the cleaning crew would, would leave uh, this aircraft that the cleaning crew just before would take up the armrest, vacuum clean it, take it down again and leave. And, and, and sort of we said to each other, hey, uh, if you take this armrest up, uh, how long time does it take to crawl into your inner seat versus if it's down and you have to sort of jump over it? And the difference was really between three and five seconds. And if you add that up, that's 
five or six minutes for entire play. That means your turnaround time actually can be very, very high. Uh, you actually will, will win five minutes or six minutes. Observation two is that why do we board the way we do? Why do we board all the A seats uh, in the inner next to the windows so all the window seats are boarding first and then all the number middle roads and all the so you actually board the plane faster all these observations are made from first-hand observation that's made from small data and you can't use that there's no way you can come up with this stuff through big data but it's such a profound impact or insight that it actually can turn around the entire ranking of, of swiss international airlines which really yes. was the case and 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 that's where i'm i'm I don't understand why companies don't want to do it, why they still are so hesitant to do it. And I think the reason why is because we become collectively blind yes. and we are more busy dealing with ourselves. So we don't even have the energy to look outside our four walls and ask ourselves these profound questions. You know, it's interesting you say that, and I agree with you. If you look at management consulting, right, the, the sort of the father of management consulting, Marvin Bauer from McKinsey, he had a rule which says that the most important thing you do when you arrive at a client is you go speak to customers and employees. You don't look at data. You go speak to them and find out what their pain points are because by and large, 90% of what they tell you is going to be true and it's going to drive the final recommendation. But if you speak to consultants today, they don't do that anymore, right? No, they don't. They, they, they are really obsessed with data, models, financial stuff, Excel spreadsheets, and so on. So a lot of times, the principles of what you're saying are, are known, but people get yeah. so distracted by being in an arms race with the latest trend. Absolutely. And, and I 100% agree with what you're saying. I think that we have hit rock bottom yes. at this stage in our society. And that's the reason why I decided to write this book. It's a good book. It's a very good book, so thank you for writing it. Oh, th thank you. Well, listen, I I wrote it because I be I became so frustrated <laughs> working in these organizations, <laughs> seeing all the crap which is going on, people running around in small circles, not achieving anything at all. Just think about this. I was working in a major bank. Yes. Helping them. And on average, they receive 700 emails. That's on average. If you spend one minute per email, that's close to a day just looking at your emails, wow. right? How can you possibly be productive? And even better, how would you be able to talk to your customers? You wouldn't have time for it, right? Yes. I do understand why banks are horrible to deal with from a customer point of view. But that has become our word. Now, one of the jokes I'm, I'm writing about in the book, and I'm sure you would have been laughing when you read that chapter, is how to set up meeting rooms. I mean, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean... I mean, it's ridiculous. The comments coming, the, how this PC doesn't work with this Mac and this screen doesn't work. And, and that's actually something system. everyone's experienced. Everyone experienced. And no one questioned it. Everyone kind of feels they're the idiot. Everyone feels, well, someone has to solve it, right? And, and they probably will do it soon, right? I'll give you an example. So I went to uh, a, a very large company in, in uh, Minneapolis. Yeah. And they had this a whole floor just allocated to meeting rooms. And there was one meeting room uh, which was called PPXT1125, <laughs> um, which is a short, sexy, easy-to-remember name, as you can, can hear, yes. right? Uh, that was the name, number I had to go to. Now, the receptionist, she was new, so she had to have a map to find this one. Um, now, once I went to it, uh, that was booked, by the way, but it was booked by an internal booking system. And the way it works is that if the internal booking system is booking it, uh, you can't use it even though it's empty. Okay? So that was an empty room. Basically, every room on that hallway was empty, but it was booked because no one used them. So they introduced another system where... When you booked a meeting, you had to confirm you were in the meeting room. So people, but you know, when you start a meeting, you don't really remember to yes. confirm that you are in this meeting, right? So after 10 minutes, you haven't confirmed it. Someone else books it. So they go into that meeting room yes. while you're sitting in the meeting room, right? So that's a side story. What happens then is I had to move to another meeting room. And she said to me, you have to go to PP99256, I think it was. I said, where is that? She said, I have no idea. Because they were not in alphabetic order, they're not in numeric order, they were no, there was no structure to it. And I said to her, how long has this been going on? She said, well, I joined about nine months ago. The previous PA, she was here for about five years. It's been like that for five years. I said, has no one questioned it? 
Well, she said, not really because it's IT running it and they're very busy, so we don't want to disturb them. That means you had literally people running around the hallways in this company, yeah. bumping into each other with maps. No one could find anything. And by the way, most of them were out meeting. There was no meeting rooms, but all the meeting rooms were empty, but no one could find a meeting room, right? Common sense. Well, the, the best example, I think, the best example you give, which is by far a universal pain point, is those terrible universal remotes that come with TVs. Yeah. I mean, my remote, I've got this fancy high definition, whatever, 5K TV, but I can only only use maybe three buttons out of 30 on my remote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, 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 now I'll tell you the story because it was I was in a hotel in Miami and I was uh, trying to switch on my television and I, it literally took me three or four minutes to switch it on. Mm -hmm. And once I watched enough television with all these commercials, then I had to switch it off. And I literally gave up because it was two off buttons two air conditioning button, one light button. So I end up with my butt in the air, unplugging the minibar and the TV because that's the only way I could switch it off. Yes. So I was really frustrated about this spaceship because I'm not sure, do you have, why do you have two on buttons? Is that because you can switch it on and then you can switch it extra on? Yeah, it doesn't I'm, make sense. So I'm not sure I get it. Anyway, so I'm sitting on this plane. It's like a bad joke, this yeah. story. Sitting on a plane a couple of months later, and this guy sits next to me. And we start to talk, and I ask him, where is, where is he from? And he's from a company where he says, you probably don't know them. I said, know them? Guess what? This company was that company producing that remote control. And I knew that because I took a photo of it and used yeah. it in some of my presentations. So I yes. remember that name very vividly. So I said to him, what the heck went wrong with you guys? And he looked at me like a deer in the headlight, and he said, what do you mean? I said, listen. I couldn't switch it on. I couldn't switch it off. I did not know how to navigate this this remote at all. He said, well, it's funny you saying it. We had that problem internally four years ago. And we had conflicts between all these different departments and who's responsible for what. So we zoned, we zoned each of the areas on the remote control. So one zone of this remote control was the area responsibility of the DVD yeah. people. And one was for the TV, and one was for the Wi-Fi, and one was for this and that. And you had seven different zones on this remote control. And they were all really happy internally because everyone knew what area on this remote control they had access to and could control. But we ended up with two on and two off buttons in return, right? And that is the essence of how companies are more focused on a point of view which is inside out. Yes, but, but there, there, there's a very important lesson here which I want to unpack, and that's why I brought up the example. I'm pretty sure that that CEO is being celebrated for finding a way to get the divisions to work together, but the reality is he found a way to get them to work together by creating problems for customers. I think that's a super point. I 100% agree with you. Because I've seen that many times where, because I've worked for many companies, and what I'm seeing internally is bad, but the press is reporting that everyone loves the CEO. He's listening to people. He's getting people to work together and talk together. But what this company actually needs is a little bit of an autocrat who is going to tell them what they need to do to serve the customer, not to please fighting factions. Absolutely. And and, and I think that uh, that comes... Back to the fact that really, really good CEOs are good at seeing the outside in point of view fast and keep it front and center and everything yes. they do. I'll give you two examples. One guy is Alan Molly, which is the former CEO of uh, Boeing and of Ford. Yeah. Boeing uh, 50, 20 years ago and, and fought, uh, I think, a decade ago. And he was sort of awarded as the number one CEO in the US for several years. Now, I spoke to him just recently, and he said when he got his job at Ford, when he arrived in his car, it was the first day on the job, yeah. he went down in the car park, in this very iconic car park they have in Ford, just driving onto this huge Ford logo, and in the car park, there's not a single Ford, Ford car. And he realized <laughs> that's where you have the problem, right? <laughs> you know, I recently read an interview in the Wall Street Journal about a, a, the CEO of a luxury brand, Marquis, and they have a photo of him in his house, and of his five cars, three of them are a competing brand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right then you know you have a problem right yeah i mean uh, yeah i know i can tell you so many stories which are just down that alley because they have some excuse i don't know where it comes from that i'm different or i'm not fitting into it 
I fundamentally believe if you're selling a product and service, if you don't use it yourself, if you're the target group and you don't use it yourself, there is a fundamental problem and well, you have to go back. The problem is like, if you're not using your product, how do you experience what your customers are going through? You don't, which, which comes back to the empathy part, because at least if you use it yourself, then you become a focus group of one. And then uh, you build up that sense of empathy or frustration when it's not working or when the call center is not working. You know, I did, I did this experiment with executives some years ago uh, for a, a large credit card company where um, the call center was just horrible. And when uh, one of the things I realized through our work was that it is in times of pain, you actually can build a really strong brand loyalty. Mm. Because if I'm through a pain and suffering, yes. I... I am in, in a sense of need. And if someone helps you in that sense, it's almost like, my God, this person saved my life. And you're so much more receptible for emotions right, at this stage. So I said to them, hey, your biggest opportunity is when people have their credit card stolen uh, or something like that. And they didn't really get it. Uh, they thought it was more important to sell more credit cards, even though when you would... Uh, have your credit card stolen, it would be a nightmare to reactivate this credit card. Literally, it would take several days and, and whatever. So I went to a restaurant with these guys. I, I did the experiment with the client. Mm. Listen, yeah, I love that and story. I, <laughs> and I had all the credit cards blocked yeah. while I was sitting in the, the taxi to them. And then in the restaurant, they had to pay and none of them had money. And it was so embarrassing for them. And they had to go through this call line and this and that. And they literally were furious and when they left the restaurant, I said to them, hey, guys, uh, how did you feel like? And they said, I'm going to kill those people in the conference. Uh, of course, and they said that to me. And I said, listen, you had to kill yourself first because you are the problem. Yes. You did not yes. see this before, but exactly. that's how the cost feels every day. Right? How can you blame the call center if the call center is doing what corporate asked them to do? Exactly. Coming down to the KPI. And coming back to the wrong focus, you're focusing inside out rather than outside in, right? Well, the, the interesting thing is when you, when I read that story, well, as I was reading the entire book, I would take photographs and send it to my team of interesting things. But I also realized that I was thinking to myself, is there someone in our company who's all they doing? Or is, at least, is someone in the organization at least spending one day a month going through what our customers experience? Because unless we do that, how do we know what they're experiencing, right? <laughs> And, and, and people don't do it. So I, I uh, and they don't want to do it, by the way. Uh, and I can tell you so many examples and ex experiences I've, I've had when I drag the employees into homes of consumers. Yes. So just to put this into perspective, over the last 15 years, I've been living and are spending time in more than 3,000 consumer homes wow. across close to 100 countries in the world. Um, so I've seen my bit of the word, I guess. And is it fun? Not always, I'll be honest with you. But it keeps me real. Yes. And I think I think it's super important that you that you have to think about one thing. If I wind back time just ten years, uh, you would not have been able to predict the consequences of social media. Yeah. You would not have been able to predict how the entire election would have had another outcome or yes. whatever, you would not have been able to uh, predict uh, how you had uh, uh, movements in countries, the Arab Springs, whatever it is, because of social media. Yes. The problem is that we as companies think that consumers are somewhat static, but technology evolves so fast that we as human beings, in order to survive, evolve equally fast. And that means whatever research you did when you joined the company two and a half years ago, yeah, I did the consumer bit. I spoke to a couple of consumers. I think, mm, hang on, about two years ago, we were out and doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, and we're selling shampoo, so things have not changed a lot. Well, things have changed a lot. We just don't think about it, right? Yes. And, 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 and that's my point back to toilets and, and the whole discussion about how even toilets have changed yes. a lot, right? Um, because of technology. So I think it's important for people to realize that part of the onboarding process and part of the ongoing certification of you staying up to date with the DNA of the consumer should be that you should spend time either in consumer homes or in customer offices on a yearly basis, if not on a monthly basis. And this is one of the rules I've introduced to multiple of our clients, that is that they each month have to spend at least one day in a mm. consumer home. Um, is that easy to introduce? No, 
Do we have a lot of complaints? Enormous amount of complaints. But once they go into a home and they experience what they see and, and feel, then they will never stop doing it. Yes. Yeah, because then they feel empathy and they feel the emotions out there and they realize, my God, this is me keeping myself alive. Yeah, but I think there's an important point we should make here so everyone is clear about this. Empathy is not about feel-good stuff. It's about hardcore capitalism. The yes. more empathetic you are, the better products you design, the better services you create, the more share of the profit pie you take and the more money you make, right? Absolutely. This is Absolutely. not about this is not about feel good stuff where we can hold hands and sing kumbaya. I mean, maybe we'll do that, but at the end of the day, we're going to sing kumbaya, drinking very expensive tea and maybe some cognac. Yeah, because we I can think, afford it. But and that's true. And I think it comes down to that our society do not accept the reality that uh, most of the stuff we do every day is irrational. Now, a lot of the neuroscience stuff we've done over the years, and we've done a lot of neuroscience stuff uh, over the year, shows that around 85% of everything you do every day is irrational. Yes. And when I ask people in meetings and in presentations and whatever, how many of you are deeply irrational? Most people will not raise their hands. In fact, very few, if any, raise their hand. Yeah. And then I ask one simple question. Have any one of you tried that you're watching television? And the remote control is flat for battery. And you have to press even harder to squeeze the last drop of battery out of it. Yes. And everyone raises their hand. And they're saying, is that rational or irrational? And then I just continue on and on, asking, do you knock on wood? Have you fallen in love? Did any one of you create a spreadsheet, yes. an Excel Microsoft spreadsheet, map down the love affair you had with your wife or your husband before you're married? I mean... We are deeply irrational. Mm. Now, irrational is basically a no-go word in our society. Mm -hmm. But if that's 85% of things we do every day, it basically is emotional. And yeah. emotional is um, empathy. And empathy is a common sense. So it's really linked very well together. Uh, yet we're completely all seeing that because it's so difficult to attach a number to it. And because we really want to attach numbers to it, because then it helps us to wash our hands, to create a format around it, a structure around it, so we can put it into a little box and we can replicate it. Well, that's fine if you want to do it. But in reality, sometimes you can't replicate things. You need to constantly revisit the emotional side in order to stay ahead of the competition, right? Yeah, I think another way to think about it is what we consider irrational is just sometimes things we can't explain yet. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's a lot. That's yes, a lot. A I mean, lot. I mean a, a retailer once said, no, I know that my half of my marketing budget works, I just don't know which half. And, and I think <laughs> today we are, today is even worse, even though we can measure more and more, I think as we know less and less. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I like that. So we've reached, we've done the call now for just over an hour. I don't know how much time you have left. I'm not sure what was agreed with you up front. <laughs> I have exactly five minutes left. And I okay. Have so is there anything you want to add or say before we wrap up? I enjoyed speaking to you a lot. Likewise. Likewise. Absolutely. Very good questions and very stimulating questions, by the way. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. I enjoyed the book. I mean, it was a very good book. It actually got me to think. I mean, the most important way I think of whether a book is useful is whether it changes the way I think, whether it modifies my behavior. Oh, that's good. Well, that means a lot to me that you're saying it, and I'll tell you why. Um, when you put so much energy in writing a book, yes. and I, I, I tried to write the book based on a very simple principle. I don't know who said it. It was Mark Twain or Winston Churchill, but one of these two people said that I wanted to write a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. And my philosophy is really, I wanted to write a super simple book. Now, yes. is it simple in the end of the day? No, it's not. But I try to explain it in a way where we can all resonate with it and where it becomes like, ah, you know, he's so right. That's yes. what I tried the other day. And once I can create a sense of empathy through the reading process, hopefully it will resonate so much with not just you, but with all the listeners that they will say to each other, we have to stop this thing. Yes. It's gone too far right now. And I honestly, with, from the bottom of my heart, feel it's gone too far now. It's become ridiculous. And no one is questioning it because we are petrified of questioning it because then we will jump outside the chicken cage. Uh, so this is really my, my scream for help. And, and I think the best way you can ask for that is to, to put up a solution. And that's what I try to do with Minister of Common Sense. I think you've done that. I'm going to have a little bit of a positive spin on that, not just crying for help. I do think that if you look at how corporations have evolved, it's, not, it's no longer enough to just be the only one offering a service. There's too much competition. So if you can 
compete with empathy, it gives you a better dimension along which to compete. It's a more sustainable way of competing, I think. And I like it. That. It, it absolutely is. And there's another really, really good dimension to this. And it is who loves to work in highly compliant rule and guideline regulated industries. Nobody. I don't think a lot of Nobody. Us really, no. And that's what the lack of common sense is producing. It's a fantastic, incredible productive factory of stupidities coming out of it as a consequence of all that stuff. So it's not just making life better for the customer. Hopefully, it's also making life better for the employees. And I think there's a lot of people suffering from that in corporate cultures today. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Absolute pleasure to have you on the call. Thank you so much. Enjoy your time in Saudi Arabia. I will do my best. (laughs) I look forward to reading about the anecdotes in your next book. Ah, yeah. I tell you, there's already a book on its way based on all this stuff. (laughs) Take care. Ciao. You too. Bye. And that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing the episode. Finally, I want you to remember that the only way to get access to our special offers, the only way to get our special pricing, and the only way to get samples of our content is to join the list on firmsconsulting.com. It's the only way also to get access to our unique advanced content that we make available to insiders. So if you want to get a sneak peek of things, test it out, see what's in there, this is the place to go. And finally, I want to thank you again for making us one of the largest podcast channels around the world for careers and for the 2 million downloads and counting.